Good morning and a very warm welcome to our service of worship again today on Sunday the 20th of September and a very warm welcome to you wherever you are and whenever you are tuning in to the service today. We are very much still at home on our own perhaps but through the Holy Spirit we have that sense of being able to join together in God's presence as we worship this morning. And in our service today, we'll be continuing our series of uh, looking at life and worship in the early church. Today, we come to the theme of creativity in the early church. And we'll look at that together later on uh, as we go through the service. But as we begin this morning, we come to our call to worship together. And the words this morning come from part of Psalm 148 in words of praise. And if you'd like to, as the words come onto the screen, we join together in the parts marked in bold. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Praise the Lord. And we do that together now as we join in our opening hymn this morning, the hymn of praise. Praise the Lord, you heavens adore him. to our opening prayer this morning there will be opportunities places through the prayer where you can join in as well these will be parts uh, on the screen and places marked in bold so if you would like to please do join in in the responses uh, and the parts of the prayer for us to be speaking together 
Let us pray. Eternal God, loving Father, how astonishing is the universe around us. Its distance unfathomable, its wonders majestic. How amazing is the world around us in the beauty and complexity of all that is made. We wonder at the passing of time that has allowed so much change and diversity, endings and new beginnings. God of transition and change, throughout all history you have led your people on challenging journeys. God of transition and change, across all times and cultures, you have called your people to fresh openness and respect. God of transition and change, with each new season, you have called your people to be ready to move on with you. God of transition and change, meet with us now through word and music. Challenge our thinking and deepen our understanding. Put a new song in our hearts and grant us a new imagination that we may be ready to follow you into the challenges and fresh opportunities in your world today. We confess together. God of generosity and grace, of compassion and concern. The stories from your word show us how great the gap can sometimes be between divine and human understanding. Forgive us when we have let attachment to our own comfort and convenience, our own understanding of justice and righteousness deter us from following the paths necessary for the well-being of our planet and the flourishing of all its inhabitants. Loving God, your compassion for our weakness and concern for our well-being, give us confidence in the generosity of your forgiveness. Out of the liberality of your grace, help us as we begin again to grow into the courage, love and understanding which are the hallmarks of your kingdom and to live in ways which will help to make this world a place where all life can flourish. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I'm very grateful now to Mae Murdoch, who will be our reader today. And she will read part of the story of Peter's visit to the home of the Roman, Roman centurion Cornelius. As a little introduction to the scene, Cornelius and all his family were devout and God-fearing. Cornelius gave generously to those in need and prayed regularly to God. In a vision one afternoon, he was told by an angel to send for Peter, who was in a city called Joppa, and to ask him to come and to encourage them. So he sends two of his servants and one of his soldiers, who was also a devout man, to go and collect Peter and to bring him back. Separately, in Joppa, Peter goes up on the roof to pray about noon the next day, just as the two servants and soldiers sent by Cornelius are approaching the city. The story tells that Peter was hungry and wanted something to eat, and while lunch was being prepared, he too received a vision. In his vision, 
Peter sees something like a large sheet being lowered from heaven, full of four-footed animals, reptiles, and birds. A voice says to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter replies, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice then says to him, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happens three times before the sheet was taken back up into heaven. And so we join the story now as Peter is wondering about the meaning of the vision. And the three men sent by Cornelius arrive at the house looking for him. Our reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 10, reading from verses 19 to 33. Peter was still trying to understand what the vision meant when the Spirit said, Listen, three men are here looking for you, so get ready and go down and do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said to the men, I am the man you are looking for. Why have you come? Captain Cornelius sent us, they answered. He is a good man who worships God and is highly respected by all the Jewish people. An angel of God told him to invite you to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Peter invited the men in and persuaded them to spend the night there. The next day he got ready and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along with him. The following day he arrived in Cicera, where Cornelius was waiting for him together with relatives and close friends that he had invited. As Peter was about to go in, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and bowed down before him. But Peter made him rise. Stand up, he said. I myself am only a man. Peter kept on talking to Cornelius as he went into the house, where he found many people gathered. He said to them, You yourselves know very well that a Jew is not allowed by his religion to visit or associate with Gentiles. But God has shown me that I must not consider my person ritually unclean or defiled. And so when you sent for me, I came without any objection. I ask you then, why did you send for me? Cornelius said, I was about this time three days ago that I was praying in my house at three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man dressed in shining clothes stood in front of me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and has taken notice of your works of charity. Send someone to Joppa for a man whose full name is Simon Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner of Leather, who lives by the sea. And so I sent for you at once, and you have been good enough to come. Now we are here, in the presence of God, waiting to hear anything that the Lord has instructed you to say. Amen. And thanks be to God for the reading of His Holy Word. We're continuing in our mini-series on the life and worship of the early church. And having looked at prayer and mission and hospitality and learning, we come today to the theme of creativity in the early church. Through our Bible story today, we'll see how each of our earlier themes are woven in different ways into our passage and theme 
for today. As we heard in the introduction and in our reading, Peter is invited by Cornelius the centurion to his home in Caesarea to bring God's word to them. On the face of it, that may not seem as something very extraordinary, but there are in fact a lot of large boundaries being crossed here and open, creative thinking needed in response. Cornelius is a commanding officer in the Roman army, and yet he would have been aware that to the Jewish people he was regarded as unclean as a Gentile, someone they would never wish to visit because it was frowned upon to do so. He is, however, humbly obedient to the angel's instruction and presses ahead to invite Peter. As a Jew, it would, still, it would have been very ingrained in Peter that it was against Jewish law for him to enter a Gentile's home and eat with him. Cornelius is furthermore an officer in the Roman army oppressing Israel. And yet, in the vision that God sends Peter, he prepares the way to open Peter's heart and mind to be willing to accept Cornelius' invitation. The traditionally unclean items of food that Peter sees in the lowered sheet come to represent also in the unfolding events of our passage people that Peter would traditionally not have chosen to associate with. Preparing Peter for the invitation he is about to receive, the voice tells Peter, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And so even though he may not as yet fully understand the meaning of the vision, Peter obediently goes as invited to Cornelius' home, along with a few others of the believers from Joppa. Eventually arriving with the three men sent by Cornelius, Peter finds quite a gathering of Cornelius' family and friends at his home all eagerly waiting and awaiting his arrival and what it is Peter will have to say to them. Peter acknowledges at the start that he is doing something against Jewish law in being with them, but he also affirms that God has shown him that he should no longer see anyone as impure or unclean. Just like Philip last week coming alongside the Ethiopian inquirer, Peter doesn't launch into a sermon straight away. Instead, he takes time to ask a question. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius reveals God's hand in leading him to issue the invitation, seeing the generosity of Cornelius's heart and answering his prayers. Now they are all gathered with eager anticipation in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord had commanded Peter to tell them. Peter begins to tell them all the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. As he does so, Peter has begun to understand that there is now no favoritism with God and all who honour him are welcomed. But just how much Jew and Gentile alike, all nations are welcomed through faith in Jesus Christ, is about to be revealed to Peter and his fellow companions. Before Peter is very far into sharing God's message with those gathered, the Holy Spirit comes upon them all. So they are heard speaking in tongues and praising God. The believers who've accompanied Peter from Joppa are astonished that these Gentiles are equally favoured and welcomed by God, and the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out even on them. Seeing these dramatic events, Peter realises that no time should be lost in allowing those gathered to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And then following this, Peter agrees 
to stay with them for a few days more, teaching and fellowshipping with them. In these events, Peter needed a sense of openness and creativity in discerning what to do. He could have been a closed book hemmed in by ingrained tradition. He could have been confused and uncertain what to do when confronted by such an unexpected situation that went against everything he'd formerly understood. Yet guided by God and trusting in his hand at work, Peter responds creatively and understands that the gospel invitation is not only for the Jewish people anymore, but it is instead for all people everywhere. Though that was something new and daunting, Peter trustingly obeys God's leading. In our days also, we have needed to find a spirit of creativity in order to keep moving on as a church in our day. Over the last 50 years or so, many changes have come, including shifts away from belief in God. Sunday no longer being special and a day to go to church, but instead filled with all kinds of other events and activities to pursue. Moves away from lengthy monologues to more lively multimedia presentations. In our changed society, churches have had to think prayerfully and creatively about offering worship and fellowship at different times, in more interactive ways like Messy Church, Cafe Church, and more recently Forest Church, for example. It's no longer enough to invite folk to church, but there's a need to come alongside others in our communities, to share interests, to meet need together, and through growing relationships, gradually encourage those we are with to glimpse the truth that God knows and loves them deeply. More immediately, in this season of COVID-19, we've had to be creative as well. No longer able to meet in church together, there's been a flurry of activity and experimentation to see what we can do with online church. It's been a big learning curve for many. What might have seemed a real problem and overwhelming challenge has become an ongoing adventure as new skills are developed, lessons are learned and fresh ideas keep coming. So many have stepped out to be creative in bringing service videos together, recording readings, writing and recording prayers and reflections, and it's wonderful to see in bringing our worship to God in these days. Even as we begin to return to church, we need a creative spirit to think about what is possible. There are things we can hold on to, but there are also things to leave behind to make us ready to move on with God. As we read in Isaiah 43, verses 18 to 19, God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Our God is a creator God and made in his image, we each have creative tendencies within. Seasons like the one we are in call us and spur us on to tap into the wells of God's creative leading to allow church and mission once again to expand in unexpectedly new and enlivening ways. Where there's a will, there's a way, as we allow the Holy Spirit's creativity to lead us. Continuing to think about and celebrate all our many ways of being creative together, we join to sing our next hymn in 612, Come to Us, creative spirit.
theme of creativity today, one of the first things we learn about God is that he is creative. As Pete Gregg from 24-7 Prayer recently said in a series in Lectio 365 on creativity in the Old Testament, we discover that at the heart of the universe, there is a being whose very nature is generous, innovative, and intrinsically artistic. As we are made in God's image, there are seeds of creativity within each of us. As children, we're often very creative. We're at a stage of learning and exploring our world, and we can be often uninhibited then in trying new things and offering our responses to the world around us. For many of us, though, as we grow up and reach adulthood, we lose touch with our artistic, creative side. Life is busy, life is full, and creativity so often gets squashed out. There's a sadness there, though, because within each of us, there may be paintings waiting to be painted, stories or poems waiting to be written. There may be songs waiting to be sung, dancing waiting to be expressed, sculptures waiting to emerge, ideas and dreams waiting to be realised. Whether we have seen ourselves as creative or not, Pete Gregg encourages us to perceive that we are each commissioned by God to follow his example in making things shaping the world and forming new possibilities. Where we have lost touch with our creative side, we can seek the Lord's help in prayerfully and intentionally making space again to reawaken it. We find an expansion of ourselves in ways God intends in listening to fresh insights from the world around us and finding space to let them take form in a drawing or a painting, in a song or a poem. It allows us to voice both pain and beauty in our world, and so in some measure to be drawn into God's heart of care and concern. Our creativity can help us observe our world more deeply. It can be offered up to God as a response of wonderment or concern for what we see. One person who has made space for creativity again in her life is local poet Mary Johnson, who often worships with us at La Suede Church. I met with her last week and asked her about how she got started in writing poetry and what inspirations she finds in her work. So Mary, lovely to be with you this afternoon. And uh, if we can start, first of all, just by asking you, um, how did you get started in writing poetry? Um, I didn't start writing, actually writing poetry until I was in my late 60s. But I'd always liked poetry and, and musical, and I had a mother who was always singing and reciting poetry. So it was very, very, very much embedded in me right from a very early age, you know. So um, I think it had always been there, so. But not always in the Doric, not always in the Doric, so. Yes, because yes. you're from Aberdeenshire. Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And you were also saying when we were chatting earlier about how much the authorised version of the Bible ah, has played its yes, part in yes, the poetry yes. of language for you. Yes, it, it doesn't matter really where you open it, you, you get the sound of poems and, the, and music. The, the opening of Genesis, um, oh dear, help me Lord, what does it say again? <laughs> In the beginning, God created. You know, and it just it just reads like a poem. You yes, know, yes. and uh, if, if we always see it written out in verses, but you could write it out like a poem. 
and there's so many of um, not just the Old Testament but in the New Testament and lots and lots of Jesus parables and sayings they are just pure poetry pure poetry you know, just, uh, and, and your mum you were saying was a great influence yes mm -hmm. yes Catholic Irish so there's a mixture there <laughs> Wonderful. And so, um, yes, you came quite late to, to writing poetry, uh, but then once you've started, what's, what's been the inspiration uh, for writing poems generally, do you find? That's kind of difficult to say because sometimes it's something you see, something you hear, something somebody says. Are you waking up in the morning with a phrase in your head? I mean, I remember, must have been around Christmas time, I must have been thinking about the nativity play and all the rest of it, and waking up in the morning saying to myself, imagine him to tell your man, you fan wa berne his. Fasis, then he spears anger like, and fa would blame him, you know, so conversation between Mary and Joseph you see so I I don't know where that came from but I woke up one morning with that in my head yes. you know, so. yes. uh -huh. but just all sorts of little inspirations yes, where yes. You are, Th things things you hear I remember hearing oh this is I think when I was at university um, a fisherman and his wife sitting from Fraserburgh sitting on the bus behind me and I heard her saying they're trying to tell us now where I descended for fish. And there was silence from the man. And then she said, I'm not hearing that. <laughs> I've written a poem about that. How <laughs> she dismisses all these famous people. I'm not hearing that. <laughs> it, was, it was lovely. <laughs> that stayed with me for years and years. So you, you never know where it's going to come from. Yes. So. yes. And once you start, does it flow for you or is it? Sometimes difficult to um, get the words to come. The only poem I've ever written straight off was the uh, um, very first poem I wrote in the Doric, and a friend persuaded me to go up to a, a day course over in Leith Academy, mm -hmm. and Alan Spence had been talking about. In fact, you can see it behind me talking about his latest book, A Way to Go, and it was about funerals and undertakers. And we went into groups to, re to write poetry, and the, the tutor said, we'll take 20 minutes to write a poem. And everybody started to write except me, because I didn't know what to write. <laughs> And I wished I hadn't come, and I was sure I was stupid, and I shouldn't be here, and I just couldn't write. And then I thought, well, I suppose I could write about the night we sat with Granny before Grandad's funeral. And I wrote that, and it all came out. And later on, when I looked at it, I realised that everything that I said in the poem was something that I heard her say that night. <laughs> I remember she started off by saying, Fitama gan to day with Thutum, he was I off a goid to me. Alki morning he brought me a cup of tea. I never told him it was our strong. <laughs> it was just in some ways so funny. But all the other things she said yeah. were things that, that she said that night about my granddad. And then we had to read it, and I read my poem out, and, and only my friend said, oh, that's so emotional, Mary. And I looked up at the man, the tutor, and I thought, he's crying, but he didn't say anything. And then when I was leaving, he came running after me, and he said, have you had many of your poems published? And I looked at him and said, I can't write poetry. He said, well, you just did. <laughs> so, so that was the very first poem, but it's the only poem I can ever think of where just, it came off in a wonder. Yeah, and it's really everything that Granny said. And Doric is a very musical dialect anyway, so the music's there and yeah. 
you know, it was, it was just lovely, so. Yeah, and I think you were saying that truth and music is so important to... to absolutely to true. If, the, yeah. I find that if I can't believe in it, I can't believe, and if I've written something and it doesn't ring true, I, I have to put it aside. And I, I wrote a poem once where I was describing the wind blowing the blossom from the apple trees. Well, I'd never seen an apple tree in my life when I was little, you know, and that just didn't ring true. It was a poem about the, the night I was born, and uh, I, I knew it was false, that it wasn't true, so... You, you, yes. But, yes. So. Uh -huh. and, and what part does your faith play in, in the poems you write and your creativity? I, I find that one difficult to answer because um, my faith is something that's just all around me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, a, a man came to see me once who was a poet. He was, he was studying up in Hawthorne Den Castle. And at one point he said to me, I can't understand how someone as intelligent as you can still believe in God. And I said, well, I don't believe in a figure up there. God to me is, you know, I'm aware of God when I'm working in the garden or when I'm listening to music. Mm -hmm. And then I spoiled it for him by saying, or when I'm making soup. <laughs> so that ended the conversation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, but that's wonderful. You were saying, I think, too, that it's been difficult to be creative in this season of COVID. Um, and where does that come from? I think because I'm so on edge, but I was telling somebody that I was going to be doing this and said, had I lost my faith? Because I, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, it's just I, I'm not in that zone. I, I'm not sinking down into that layer where things just come into you and suddenly makes sense. I think a lot of creative people, um, especially writers, we we live through s similes and metaphors. Nothing ever is as it seems. It's always like something else, you know. So mm -hmm. I think I think there's that. So not being aware of that, being tense the whole time. So yes, yes. I, I don't know. But I, I know I'm not the only one. I was pleased in a way to hear that Kathleen Jamie, who's a very famous Scottish um, um, poet and much younger than me and she was my mentor in a course I was on once and uh, I heard her interviewed recently and she said she was having difficulty writing because yeah. it's not relaxed as you know. Yeah, it's fascinating really. Mm -hmm. so, but thank you. And perhaps just to finish, um, could you read us one of your poems? Right. So maybe just introduce it, but um, read it for us and the, the lovely sound of the Doric. Well, you, you want the one about <coughs> the first time I was told the crucifixion story, yes. Yes, yes this was a young, um, very, very young Sunday school teacher, and it was up in Canella Church. and. Um, she described in vivid, vivid detail the crucifixion and what had happened to Jesus. And then she ended up telling us that this happened to Jesus because we had all been so bad. And I just wanted to scream, he didn't have to do that for me. I would never have been as bad as that, you see. So this is the poem. Tell me. Mom, Mom. She burst into the house, Sunday school lesson finished. Can for the teacher tells us today? She tells us the crucifixion. She said, bad men took Jesus, laid him down on a cross, hammered nails through his hands and his feet, sang, hoisted him up so as nobody could see him, and hours and hours after he did. She tells us he did like that on the cross because we was are so bad. He didn't need to do that for me. I've never been that bad. Have I, Mum? Have I? Have I? <laughs> have I? 
Oh, yes, well, quite. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you very much. And what, perhaps just also if we could um, have you read the confession time. Oh, yes, the code, yes. That just as a, a yes. lovely kind of sense of the creativity yes. of your yes, of it's, ideas it's, that uh, come to mind. It's, uh, I grew up with cows and I, I'm not fond of horses. I don't like the smell of horses or sheep, but cows, yes, because that's my dad's smell, you know, in the buyer. So this one's called Confession Time. And I remember the day this happened because I used to walk through the field with them and they'd follow you. And I wasn't frightened, but this particular day they followed me and I started to run and I started to run and and I got to the gate, I got over the gate, and then I stood looking at them, and they were all round about the gate, and they were looking at me, with these great big brown eyes. So this is the poem. Confession time. You stand the gither at a yet, a burhi a coos. Confession time. I ken you ken a about me. You look at me, nae throw me, but into me. And you never tuck your een off me, chawing the cud, rumbling the gas, runyon, runyon, moo like old wifey's trying out new teeth. You give a bit nod to in another, shock your head and misdoot, snort out your breath miscomforted, give a bit stump of your feet, sign, kissing tails hoisted up, steaming, splitting, skitter, splutters doon and blue bottles biz o'er the charney bannocks. Your brune ain't shining me, often forgotten, often forgiven. I like that one. It's beautiful. <laughs> I like that one. Yes. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mary. That's been wonderful to hear your ideas and thoughts and your creativity and to hear you reading some of your poetry. Thank you well, ever thank, so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> My grateful thanks to Mary for all that she shares there and I hope there is an encouragement for us all to become more creative again in ways that we love, perhaps ways that we've lost touch with or perhaps we can let things flow and experiment in these days for the first time with a drawing or writing a few lines in response to something we see or hear and find a fullness and delight in that expression of creativity. I'm grateful now to John Adamson as he leads us creatively in our prayers of thanksgiving for ourselves and others. Let us pray. Let us all pray. O most merciful and gracious God, from whose open hand we have received much, we ask you to accept the offerings of your people, gifts of time, talents and money, remembering in your love those who have given it. Remember also those persons and purposes for which it is given. So follow this sacrifice with your blessing, that it may promote peace and goodwill and advance the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Gracious God, we worry about the way things are going. Daily life has been uprooted by the pandemic and also by war and environmental devastation. Send your spirit of healing and reconciliation to lead people to peace with justice. Heal the earth and bring hope for renewed relationships. Help us learn from this anxious time how you invite us to live in balance with each other and with your whole creation. Gracious God, we are concerned about all the divisions we see around us, many laid bare in responses to the pandemic. Communities are torn apart by suspicion and discrimination. People are judged severely by race and ethnic origin. Send your spirit of healing and reconciliation to open hearts which are full of prejudice and ease the lives suffering its effects. Heal the hurt and bring hope for lasting unity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, with thankful hearts we bow before you. Such is your love for us 
that our names are written in the palm of your hand. Such is your love for us, that you gave your only Son into the world for us, that we might live and know life in all its fullness. We give thanks that Jesus came. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, with thankful hearts we bow before you, believing that you know our situation, because you lived as we live. You woke, you slept, you ate, you drank, you walked, you talked, you worked, you rested, you spoke, you were silent, you loved, you lost. We thank you that Jesus lived. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, with thankful hearts we bow before you, believing that in your precious Son you took upon yourself our pain, our brokenness, our hurting, and our death. We thank you that Jesus died. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, with thankful hearts we bow before you, believing that in you life is stronger than death, hope is stronger than despair, Light is stronger than darkness. We thank you that Jesus rose and lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, with thankful hearts we bow before you, believing that you came down to us and will, according to your loving purpose, lift us up to you, now and when finally you call us to yourself. We thank you that Jesus ascended and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. O most merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, in whose strong name we pray. Amen. Back in May this year, a great number of churches across the UK were very creative in getting together remotely to produce the song, The Blessing, which many of you may have seen already. It was a wonderfully creative and imaginative way of responding to the COVID-19 crisis when so many were in the midst of feeling very anxious and isolated and uncertain. All these many churches got together to sing the wonderful words of the Lord bless you and keep you and to sing it over the nation as a real blessing upon everyone and a reminder and encouragement of God's presence with us in the midst. So we'll listen to that now. Turn his face 
from heaven this isn't second guessing we know that we are protected may the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message grace and favors in your nature in your essence may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand Generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family. Children, in the children, may His presence go before you and behind you and beside you. My very grateful thanks to you all for joining in again today in this time of worship together. And my grateful thanks also to those who have taken part again today in the service. I'm very grateful indeed. And also my grateful thanks to the production team 
uh, to John Adamson and Andrew Jack for all that they do to bring the service together uh, for us all to enjoy. And may you have time to be in touch with your creative self in the week ahead and find fun and delight in that, in whatever form it takes for you. I pray too that you know the Lord's leading and his comforts and upholding in whatever is coming in the week ahead for you. But now we close with the words of the blessing. May the blessing of God, the creator, be on you. The blessings of challenge and change, the blessings of travel and transition, the blessings of discovery and deepening, the blessings of flourishing and fulfillment. May these blessings of the kingdom be yours today and in the coming days. Amen.